Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeremy Daly. So today we're going to talk about unleashing developer productivity with infrastructure from code. So I want to start with this question. What if our approach to cloud development is fundamentally wrong? So think about that for a second. So what I want you to do is reach under your seat. There's a packet with a red pill and a blue pill. Oh, nobody did it. OK, I thought somebody would. So let's pretend we have a red pill and a blue pill. So if you're happy with the way you build applications in the cloud, you love writing tons of configuration code, you love the slow development cycles, the slow feedback loops, things like that, go ahead and take that blue pill. Otherwise, take the red pill. We'll see how deep this rabbit hole goes. Uh, oops, hit the wrong one. Uh, so again, my name is Jeremy Daly. Uh, I am the CEO and founder at Ant. Um, we are a new company. We were formerly Serverless Cloud. We just spun out from Serverless Inc. Um, I have been consulting with companies in the cloud for a very long time. In fact, I've been doing this for 25 years. Um, so if you don't think I look that old, thank you very much. Um, I started working with AWS in 2009, uh, back when it was EC2 instances. I think this was before they even had load balancers. Uh, and then Lambda in 2015. Um, I do quite a bit of blogging, uh, jeremydaily.com. I'm an OSS contributor. I have a bunch of open source packages. Uh, and clearly, I do some speaking. I also have a newsletter about serverless that I publish every Tuesday, so sign up for that. Um, I am the founder and co-host of the Serverless Chats podcast. So if you like hearing me talk, you can listen to that as well. Uh, I'm also an AWS serverless hero, uh, which is a great program that AWS offers that basically gives us a little bit of say in sort of what happens with the development of products um, around serverless and other great tools that are in AWS. But most importantly, I'm a developer. Uh, and I am a developer who thinks that building cloud apps is still way too hard. Um, so today, here's what we're going to talk about. First, we're going to talk about how building applications have changed over the last 20, 15, 10, 5 years, so forth. Um, we're going to look at the benefits and the limitations of infrastructure as code, so IAC, CloudFormation, things like that. Then we'll talk about the infrastructure from code approach. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the evolving ecosystem of infrastructure from code, as well as this idea of adaptive architectures, which is pretty cool, um, and then some key takeaways and some further reading. So to set our sort of minds where they need to be, um, I want to talk about this idea of single server versus multi-service apps. Um, so we don't build single server applications anymore. At least I hope nobody is building single server applications anymore. Instead, we build distributed systems by composing all of these different cloud services together, which is great, gives us all types of capabilities. But the problem is, is that when you start stitching multiple applications or multiple services together, you get all sorts of cross service complexity. And that includes things like IAM, who here loves IAM? Anybody? Show of hands? Nobody? OK. Um, state management, timeouts, network latency, how you handle failovers and retries. Um, and if we know Werner Vogel says everything fails all the time, so it's just something else you have to think about when you're building distributed systems. Now, some of you may have heard this idea that cloud is the new computer. And if you think about all of the different services that AWS has, those are like subsystems of a larger system, right? So whether it's SQS or it's EventBridge or it's DynamoDB or Lambda, these are all different services that need to work together, um, and they're like the subsystems of a computer. But it's a little bit more complex, and we've come up with this term called cloud native. Um, and the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, I guess, came up with this term. But the idea behind cloud native is that it's this group of technologies that allows you to run all these types of dynamic environments in public, private, hybrid clouds. So things like containers and microservices and declarative APIs. Now, this is interesting. But if anybody knows Alan Vermoulian, who is like a 22-year veteran at Amazon.com, he was one of the original creators of uh, Amazon S3, essentially, they built these services at AWS because you can't do these things in a local data center, right? The types of applications that you can build are so amazing. There's so, there's so many different things you can do. You can't port those back to your data center because you don't have those primitives that AWS has built. 
And also, the level of scale, right, and the capabilities that you can build in the public cloud are a lot different than what you can do in your local, um, in your local data center. And the other thing that's really interesting, and I know we hear the term democratize things all the time, but essentially, you can't go and build your own data center if you're a small startup. But if you're using AWS, all of this power is available to you right now, and in most cases, you only pay for what you use. Um, now, Eric, uh, sorry, Andre Erickson uh, is the founder of a, another company called Encore, and he has this great quote. We basically said that cloud software is no longer written, it is composed, right? And it's composed of all of these core primitives that we were just talking about. So for things like compute, this is Lambda and Fargate and App Runner. Or for databases, you've got DynamoDB, you've got Aurora Serverless, you've got ElastiCache, storage in S3 buckets or EBS. You've got application integration services, which are absolutely amazing. Things like API Gateway or SQS, step functions for state machines, event bridge for your, your uh, enterprise event bus. Um, and then a bunch of these content delivery and analytics services like CDNs, a global CDN with CloudFront. You get global DNS with, um, uh, with uh, Route 53, as well as you can use it as a database sometimes, it depends. And then analytics using uh, Kinesis and things like that. Plus, there are over 200 more services just in AWS alone that all need to be stitched together to build these new applications. Now this is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation's cloud, lan cloud Native Landscape, but that's not true. Actually, this is it, right? So there are over a thousand products, platforms, and frameworks that are beyond the scope of AWS. And this doesn't even really include all the services at uh, Google Cloud or Azure or Oracle or all these other cloud, Cloudflare, things like that. So with all these different services out there, clearly we need a way to easily configure and compose these services together. So what we've come up with in this modern way of building applications is infrastructure as code, okay? And the question is why would we use infrastructure as code? Well, one, we said it. Configurations became extremely complex, right? So it's very hard for us to go in and configure every service individually. We wanna make sure that we can configure these with a simple interface. The other thing is we don't want people clicking around in the console. If you've been in the console lately, you probably shouldn't have been. No, we wanna make sure that we don't go in and make changes because we can't keep track of those changes. And that's why we wanna have re redu uh, sorry, re reproducibility of environments. Now, if you're building serverless applications, especially in AWS, it is great. You can spin up a, an environment, tear it down, spin it up, tear it down, and it's always the same every single time. That way you avoid all that, that drift that's there. It also gives you a way to show what it is that you've actually built and map that out in like a code repository so you can track those changes, you can collaborate on that and things like that. So there are sort of two, pro two approaches to infrastructure as code. Um, the first was the declarative approach. And this is probably familiar if you've used CloudFormation or Terraform, um, or even if you've used the serverless framework or uh, SAM or Architect. The problem with these, and again, these are great services. I don't want to say these aren't great services. The problem, though, is that they're custom DSLs. It's something new that you have to learn, right? You have to know how to indent these YAML files, and if you don't indent it right, there's all kinds of problems. Um, so that's the first approach. The second approach, though, was this idea of an imperative approach, right? So as these DSLs, as these do domain-specific languages started to become more complex, um, we needed a way to make it a little bit easier to handle things. Now, is, if anybody's used the serverless framework in here, this is something that actually the serverless framework did very early on um, with serverless plugins, is they actually let you write JavaScript that would then generate some declarative code for you. So this was great if you were building like build pipelines or you wanted to uh, have multiple buckets spun up or things like that because you could write those loops. Um, you couldn't do that in CloudFormation, for example. Um, so this was sort of that first sign that declarative wasn't enough, uh, and it was that shift from the custom configurations that were to, or a, con a configuration to a custom language. Um, so the output was still YAML. You're still generating CloudFormation at the end of the day, but it let you start to jump into different languages. And then that's when these new solutions came out. So 2019, I think it was, uh, the AWS CDK came out, uh, as well as Pulumi. 
So this was a better way for some people. It was easier for them to write these, you know, they had better constructs and things like that. Made it a little bit easier for people to write infrastructure as code. But the issue here is that every time you compile down or you synthesize your CDK or your Pulumi, you're doing this once prior to deployment, okay? And this is where some of the limitations of infrastructure as code comes in. Clearly, this guy is very angry. Um, so the first part of it is there's a tremendous amount of duplication and drag as different parts of your application need to be expressed in not only your code, your application code, but also in your infrastructure as code, right? So in your configuration. There is something, too, about this static architecture where while your application is sort of in flight, while it's receiving requests and it's collecting data and it's getting mappings to it and the whole deal, that is kind of at conflict with the, that's a more dynamic nature. So it's at conflict with this idea of a static architecture. And then you are writing control plane specific instructions. So when you say, I want a Lambda function with 1,024 megabytes of memory or this for the timeout or whatever, you are specifically telling AWS what resources you need and then you create a static set of architecture. So you need to understand where your code is going and how that is gonna be coupled. And there's another thing that's come up over the last couple of years, which I think is really, really interesting. It's this idea of configuration over code. And so if you think about a Lambda function, you cannot write defensive code in a Lambda function to catch a timeout. You can't write defensive code in a Lambda function if the function just fails, if there's some sort of exception. You can't write defensive code if the function never fires because something happened and the event never made it there, okay? So in order for you to handle those types of business, business logic, which I think still is in, in a way integrated into how your application runs, you need to put that into configuration. You need to put that into your IAC. And what that actually then does is it tightly couples your code, your application logic is now tied tightly to the infrastructure code, which is tied tightly to the infrastructure itself, and that whole architecture is all kind of put together. All right, so if we were gonna build a simple web service, all right, and we'll, this will be a simple serverless web service, um, what we would do is we would start with our client, we would make a request to an API gateway, hit a Lambda function, DynamoDB, grab some data, send it all back through. Now, if we were going to build this with the CDK, all right, it's about 40 lines or so of configuration. So it's not too much, and again, this is an eye chart, you're not meant to read this, but essentially you're bringing in a few constructs for Lambda and for DynamoDB. Um, you know, you set your table name, you set some permissions and, and, and some of the IEM things, stuff like that. Easy enough. All right, serverless framework. A little bit more, maybe 60 lines of code or so, but same idea. This is a DSL, so it's very much so, you know, YAML file. But again, you're bringing in some permissions there, you're setting up your DynamoDB table, things like that, about 60 lines of code. AWS SAM, similar, okay? So you've written between 40 and 60 lines of code just to set up your architecture. And now we have to write some application code. So this is just a simple express app uh, in JavaScript, nothing complex. Um, but the idea here is if you look at this, we're importing Express, we bring in cores, because everybody loves cores. We bring in the DynamoDB client, um, we initialize that, we initialize the Express app, we, we set a get route, we call the table here, we use a get item command and so forth. Now, we set up all this infrastructure as code. Now, this is just for a super simple, super, this is it, this is the, the entirety of the code. So, for our infrastructure as code, whether that was with CDK or whatever, we've already written a bunch. And that, by the way, will synthesize to maybe 500, 600, 700 lines of cloud formation, right? But we've written this code on top of that other code. And if you look at this, you can kind of see, well, this looks like you're creating an API. And it looks like you're creating a get route to an API. That seems pretty obvious just by looking at the code. And it also looks like you are trying to do a get item on a DynamoDB table that's named users, so you need some permissions, right? So if you think about it, there's a bunch of information that we can gather just from looking at the code itself. Forget about the IAC, the infrastructure as code. Let's look at just the application code. So what if there's another way, sort of an interpretive approach, if we want to call it that? And essentially what this would do is this would say all of our resources that we need to run our application, what if we can infer those from the application logic itself? And then what if all the permissions that we need 
are all based on the service interactions. If you think about it, if you've ever written a serverless application, you have full control over what permissions you set. It's not like it's like, oh, we're trying to protect something here. You have control of that. So if you're writing the code that accesses something, why not give them the permissions there? Um, the behavioral semantics, uh, those can be declared by the event handler. So how I process a stream, how I, you know, whether I do timeouts or so forth, what if that can be handled by the event handlers? And then intra and inter-service inter communications, those could automatically be mapped just based off of some constructs in the code. And that ultimately what it would do, it, was, it would decouple your code from the underlying infrastructure. So, this is an interesting approach. We're not the only ones, or I'm not the only one to have thought of that. Uh, and about a year ago, uh, Sean Wang, who actually used to be on the Amplify team here, was also um, worked at Temporal, worked for Netlify for a bit. Um, he came up with this idea where he said, there'll eventually be these advancements where your programming languages and your cloud infrastructure will basically converge into this excuse me, single paradigm, right, where the program will get everything that it needs and be optimized just by the environment that runs it. So this was a really interesting idea, and when he wrote this, he didn't realize that there were a whole bunch of people already doing this. Um, so he called this the self-provisioning runtime, which is a really, really interesting way to think of it. We think of it a little bit differently as infrastructure from code. And the idea behind infrastructure from code hopefully is Pretty straightforward. Instead of writing all this low-level control plane specific logic and all these instructions, infrastructure from code will actually infer those requirements from the logic and then provision the optimal cloud um, infrastructure for you. So we showed a very brief example, but I want to actually go into how this actually works, because I know there's probably a lot of people saying this is impossible, this, this, won't, this won't work. All right, so let's start with simple examples. Now, this is the way that we are doing it at Amped. Um, there are other people out there, I will talk about them in a bit, uh, about how they're doing it, but this is just some basic examples. So if you wanted to create an API or a CDN, that snippet of code right there, or that snippet of code right there, is more than enough to tell the system that you need a, a CloudFront distribution with an API gateway and let's say a Lambda function to process off of it. If you want to do something a little bit more complex and you said, well, I needed a timeout, this is where that, those instructions can be passed into the handler and you can say, well, I just want this to timeout after two seconds, for example, right? So pretty simple example there. What about data storage or change data capture? So again, you can build whatever interfaces you want on top of a DynamoDB table, but essentially data.set or data.get or data.getuser.star is just an abstraction on top of a GSI. And this is something that can be done easily. This just says, I need a DynamoDB table. Now, you can name the table if you wanted to, but you don't have to. It could just create a default name for you. But what if you wanted to do change data capture? Well, you could look at something like, well, I, I want to get all the created and the updated events, right? So this can tell the system, okay, you've got a data done on handler, we need DynamoDB streams, and we need a Lambda function to process that handler that we, we want there. Cron tabs and scheduled tasks, also not a super complex thing. Um, so let's say you want to run a schedule every hour or a cron tab that runs every Tuesday on midnights, then we can set that up with a cloud, or sorry, a, a vent bridge rule now, I guess, um, and a Lambda function that processes it, right? Now, if you wanted to do something where it ran for, let's say, 20 minutes, we know that Lambda functions can only run for 15 minutes, so this little snippet of code can say, well, I can't deploy this to a Lambda function, so I would have to deploy it maybe to Fargate, uh, you know, Fargate tasks that I'll schedule, and I'll run that. Um, object storage uh, is also a, uh, a pretty simple thing to do. It's just an abstraction on top of S3. Uh, you can have other things like copy or create download URLs, but let's say that you wanted to do uh, event listeners. So you say storage.on, every time somebody writes to the user-uploads bucket or the folder within a specific bucket, then we go ahead and set up a, um, an event trigger and call a Lambda function to process it. So up until now, these are all been pretty simple. Hopefully these are relatively easy to follow. But now as we get more complex, we start thinking about events, queues, pub sub, things like that. So with, the, um, with an event or a you know, simple event, publish, user.join, send some data into it, this can easily be accomplished with spinning up event bridge behind the scenes. But if you wanted to say delay it, maybe you want to send it after a day, event bridge now has event bridge 
timers, I think they're called, or schedules, or something like that. Um, but you could also maybe use SQS and a combination of DynamoDB, or whatever you needed to do to make sure that you could delay a particular event. <clears throat> but if you wanted to listen to those events, something that's interesting is a simple user.joined events.on, um, that can listen for that um, for that event, for that user.joined event. But what if it's more complex? What if you say something like, well, I actually want these in batches of 10, and I want the events to be ordered. Now, this is a more complex setup, but by specifying these behavioral sort of semantics within your handler, the interesting thing you can now do is you can say, well, maybe we need SNS. Maybe we need a Kinesis stream in order to handle this. And now your code is telling the infrastructure how to process the inputs as opposed to you saying, here's how I want to process my inputs, and then writing code to deal with that. Now, infrastructure from code itself shouldn't be confused as the end all, right? It is literally just the interface to start building these apps. And the reason why we think about it as an interface is because we want the cloud, or at least the service in between your code and the cloud, to understand what your code is trying to do. And when you understand your code, this is when it gets really, really exciting. So first of all, self-provisioning is right out of the box, right? So no configuration, deterministic uh, infrastructure deployments, all based off of your app code. So you write an API handler, you write an event handler, whatever, that just automatically spins up whatever infrastructure you need. The other thing that it can do is self-instrumentation. If you know how a piece of code is supposed to behave, then you can automatically instrument it with whatever, you know, whether it's Datadog or whether it's uh, um, you know, a New Relic or whatever it is, you could automatically instrument it with that, but you could just instrument it within the system itself so you know, you, know, you have that built-in monitoring, you have the built-in tracing, and you know what it's supposed to do, so you have a complete observability solution already built in just by writing regular code. It's self-documenting. So think about gr creating graphs or showing you how everything is connected, whether that is down to the individual service, if you wanted to see that detail, or even if it's just broken up as a, as a broader, like this is an event bus and, and things like that. But that idea of self-documenting is you can visualize all those mappings and you have all of the handlers, the schedules, the events that's all available to you. It's also self-testing. So you write an endpoint, you create a, a data processing handler, you create any of these things, and these are now automatically available to you, right? So you can go ahead and self-discover these things, run tests against them. Self-auditing, so deterministic deploys is a really interesting thing, but if somebody changes something, now that can track all the code that's changed, it can track all the infrastructure that's changed, um, and you have a complete history of all that. The other thing that we try to do with understanding the code is we want to make sure that we are not deploying to something that needs to be managed. So anything that is self-managed means that we can go ahead and deploy it to the right service that doesn't, uh, that doesn't involve you having to spin up like a Kubernetes cluster or something like that. So we try to use all self-managed services, make it super easy for you as the developer. And then, Think about self-optimization. So, you know, I don't know if anybody's used power tools or something like that, but there's some really interesting tools out there that you can test the different memory settings or test, you know, different parts of, you know, timeouts and things like that to figure out what is the most optimal way to use your, um, to use your application. But um, we can do that automatically. If you understand the code and you know that you, what code runs where and so forth, you could actually test the memory settings, find the optimal patterns, and then actually migrate code and move things around to make sure that your app is running the best that it can. And then self-upgrading. So one of the greatest things about using a serverless tool like DynamoDB is it gets a new feature, it's just available to you immediately. The problem is, is that in order to use those new features, you usually have to go in and change your code. If your code isn't written against a specific primitive and it's just more about the use case, then the interesting thing is, is that that upgrade, if there's a new capability or even a new service that might replace something, that can happen automatically without you ever changing uh, any of your code. Um, and then this brings up a really interesting thing about portability across technologies. So if you write code for a Lambda function right now, you're writing code for a Lambda function. You usually you can't just pick that up and drop that handler in some other uh, compute environment. So if you understand the code, then you can pick the right services to run. So whether it's Kafka or whether it's Kinesis or whether it's SQS or whatever queue service you want to use, 
for all those critical workloads, the code can look at what you're trying to do and it can pick the right managed service to automatically work for you. Of course, serverless compute is one of my favorites. I love Lambda functions. Um, so for anything that is either low volume or highly vari variable, if it's event-driven workloads, um, anything like that, serverless functions are great for those. So you can take the right handlers, put those in serverless functions, you're good to go. There's also the edge is becoming very, very popular. Cloudflare and even um, AWS and Fastly and a lot of these other companies are really experimenting with edge computing. So there's a lot of great things that you can do that is good to bring your code as close to the user as possible. But you can't necessarily call a database from the edge. You don't have the same type of regional access that you would at the edge. This is very complex for the average developer, for any developer to figure out, right? So if this is automatically managed for you and say, well, this can run close to the users, it can automatically deploy it there. And I know I'm a big serverless guy, I love serverless, but sometimes orchestrated containers are the right choice, um, especially for these high volume sustained workloads Containers are really, really good at you know, serving up things with low latency. It's sort of that perfect combination of optimization and performance. Um, so something like App Runner, for example, is a great thing to, uh, a great thing to use. Um, so the next thing is this is sort of thinking forward a little bit. But one of the things that this will eventually open up is this idea of adaptive architecture. So, Things like auto-scaling, failover, and resiliency, we get a lot of that with the services that we use for AWS. But what happens if a service goes down in a particular region, right? Think about if you understand the code, you understand what's supposed to happen there, you can automatically shift traffic to different regions. So like multi-region out of the box, things like that. Um, the ability to scale up is, is built into most services, but there's nuances to some of that. All of that stuff can be sort of configured in or can be self-learning as part of this solution. There are people that are working on self-indexing uh, databases, which is really, really exciting. Um, so imagine if you didn't have to pick all your GSIs or you didn't have to create all of your, um, all of your different indexes on your database, that just based off of the patterns that you were accessing data, it eventually optimize itself and figure out what the, right, um, what the right indexes were that needed to be there. And then reactive telemetry and observability, this is something that's really cool. This is what we talked about where looking at the memory, looking at the latency, even your service dependencies, things like predictive scaling. So if you have traffic patterns, automatically having the system understand that rather than you having to go in and figure out what your, your patterns are and, and all that kind of stuff. These are all really interesting things that adaptive architecture could eventually do for you. All right, so all these things happening automatically for you behind the scenes. Everybody is saying, I need more control. That's all of you sitting in the room right now. You're like, nope, I'm sorry, I, I don't believe it. All right, I'm gonna drop, this is the first time the red pill is really gonna come in here. You never had control, okay? And that is the illusion, all right? And I'm gonna tell you why. The cloud is not just somebody else's computer, all right? You're not just renting a machine somewhere and you go ahead and spin it up and run whatever you want on it, okay? The cloud is an extremely complex, globally distributed system that requires all this constant maintenance and optimization. There's all these people at AWS right now that are behind the scenes switching out, uh, you know, switching out plates and all kinds of stuff, trying to make it work you don't have the ability to make a lot of those optimizations, and even if you did have the ability, it's so complex, again, so specialized that you probably wouldn't know how to make those anyway. And this is the important point. That's awesome, that's good that we don't need to know all of these complexities, okay? So AWS has a whole bunch of knobs that you can turn, right? Give you, you know, and they're not placebos, they're not like the elevator closed door button, which doesn't work, by the way. Um, they, they do allow you to change things like memory or you know, throughput, some, some things like that, how many shards you have, stuff like that. There are things that you can control in AWS and those are the things that make sense for you to control. But any sort of performance tuning, anything that goes beyond choosing the right architecture or you know, code optimizations like you know, infinite loops or whatever you're doing, all of that stuff is essentially out of your control but if you ever run into a problem, this has happened to me a couple of times, where you kind of reach the limit of a service, just contact the service team and they will be more than happy to work with you to make it work for you because if, it, if you are hitting a limit, there's something in there that they're not potentially doing right and they can optimize that um, and get that to where that needs to be. 
Um, so we are actually much closer um, than people might think to this idea of infrastructure from code and adaptive architectures uh, and some of these other things here. So there are a whole bunch of companies in the space. Amped is one, Encore, Clotho, Shuttle, Nitric, uh, Chaos, Dark. Um, these have been around, uh, you know, some of them are newer, some of them are a little bit, um, have been around for a little bit of time. Um, but every one of these is working on sort of a different approach to making it easier for you to build cloud applications. Um, and I reached out to a whole bunch of these founders and I wanted to know, I said, you know, why, why is this, you know, why do you believe in this approach? What is so interesting uh, about this approach for you? Um, and so the, the team from Clotho basically, they love this idea of adaptive architectures and this was a great line, code is the spec, right? And the code doesn't change. The code is the truth of your application, but the infrastructure that it runs on that can change. That's the idea behind this uh, adaptive architecture, which I think is pretty cool. Um, Shuttle, now they're Rust-based, right? Which is really cool if anybody here loves Rust. Um, but essentially, they're using infrastructure as code to create the, uh, the primitives, but then all of those things, all those outputs need to be wired together, and then they're using the Rust API to do that and fill in all those gaps, which is a really cool approach that they're, they're taking. Um, Encore, uh, I mentioned Andre. Um, this is something interesting for them is they're very much so about understanding the code, right? The more you understand the code and how it interacts with the infrastructure and other services um, is a really, really important step. Whereas we, right now, we te technically tell the system how to understand our app as opposed to it just understanding our app. Um, modal, which is super cool if anybody's doing Python, uh, like data science, this allows you to essentially write a Python script and it just automatically spins it up in hundreds of uh, containers in the cloud for you. Um, their big thing is about not running code on your laptop, right? Not trying to bring the cloud to you, but you bring essentially, or trying to put the cloud on your laptop and run things locally. So the idea of having these fast feedback loops in ephemeral environments is a really great thing because now you can go ahead and run things in high fidelity mode, basically, so that how your app runs is how it works. So no more of this like, well, it works on my machine thing. Um, and then the Nitric guys, this is cool. They're about portability. And this was another key point that they made. When you're building a cloud application, if you think about all the decisions that you have to make, right? Should I use Kinesis? Should I use EventBridge? Should I, you know, should I put this in the uh, you know, ECS or with a load balancer? Should I use AppRunner? There's just so many decisions to make. The idea behind how they see this is you can delay those decisions. You just write code, we'll spin up the infrastructure that makes sense to run the code as you have it, and then over time, if you eventually need to graduate from that, that's um, you know, something that you get, definitely can do. Um, so at Amped, the way that we look at it is this idea of essentially building an operating system for the cloud. Um, and you know, again, we look at the cloud as the computer, we look at all these subsystems, but there needs to be a way that you can tie all these subsystems together. Um, so the key tenets here are you only write application code. All right? So there's no more YAML, there's no more configuration files, you just write your code as you would normally write it. We want to focus on use cases and outcomes as opposed to the primitives. So you don't say, I want a Lambda function to do this. You just say, I have a handler that is running this code, and the system figures out the best infrastructure that's needed to run it. You use familiar patterns to define your business logic, right? So if you've ever used Express um, or something similar to that, you already know how to use this, this service. Um, we automatically deploy and manage all the infrastructure to support the app, whether that's on our service, on our cloud or on uh, AWS or to your cloud. Um, we provide very simple development workflows. And this is the key, right? Like, it is so painful to build a cloud app with AMP right now, you can basically go ahead and make a change. It's synced and published and available for you to test in less than a second in the cloud, right? You get testing, the deployment's all built in. We also integrate with a bunch of third-party apps uh, and APIs, and we can go ahead and instrument and orchestrate some of those for you as well. Um, and then this is the key thing. We are optimizing your infrastructure over time, all right? And I think all these guys eventually are gonna to get to this point, or all these people that are building these, these services, um, you know, there's amazing, there's amazing companies out there. This is where we're gonna to get to. We're gonna just optimize the code automatically for you and optimize that infrastructure so that it runs really, really well. I kinda of went fast here, but I'll give you a couple of key takeaways and we can open up for some questions. Um, so, takeaways. 
We build modern cloud apps by composing multiple cloud services together, all right? This is a very good thing. It gives us a lot of control over the individual services. Everyone is scale every different service is scalable uh, individually, and you have a lot of control over it. When you build multi-service native cloud applications, it is still really hard, all right? If you don't think it's hard, you're not doing something right. Um, infrastructure as code, it tightly couples your app code to your static architecture. Uh, higher level abstractions can still provide the control you want or the control you actually can have while reducing all of that redundancy and infrastructure from code accelerates development, decouples your business logic from the underlying infrastructure, understands that structure of your application, and enables platforms to optimize over time. Um, the AMP team has set up a site called infrastructurefromcode.com. All of these links uh, are there, and there's a couple of other ones that we've added as well. Um, super interesting stuff, especially the self-provisioning runtime one uh, by Sean Wang uh, is, is super exciting. So, that's the, the bulk of the talk, uh, so make sure you complete the, uh, the survey.